Once again, let me welcome all of you that are here, those of us joining online, those that are other campuses. We're glad you're with us this morning. This spring break weekend, you are the hardy few who stayed here in Illinois. Good for you, extra credit for you. I hear the reward is it's going to snow this afternoon, so. All right. It's great to be together to worship our holy God this morning. And I just want to say to those of you who are regular givers financially to the mission of God here at Chapel Street, we're so grateful for your uh, generosity. We believe that generosity reflects the heart of God because at the center of our faith is this central fact that God gave his only son. And we reflect him when we're generous. Generosity honors God. It moves the mission of God forward in the world. Uh, and it's good for our souls. It reminds us that we're not uh, in bondage to our stuff and our things. And so again, thank you for being generous to what God is doing in our church family uh, and here and, and around the world. We look forward to telling you the stories of the impact of our collective generosity. Now, uh, before we jump into this morning's sermon and I introduce our guest, let me just let you know, uh, some of you are aware, if you've been tracking, uh, Dr. John Dixon, professor at Wheaton College of New Testament and Public Christianity, has uh, been part of our church family now for a bit, now uh, preaching several times. I'm super excited for this week and next week in this two-part series he's going to bring to us called The Road to Resurrection, looking at the evidences for and the impact of the resurrection of Jesus. You know, sometimes you read authors and you hear them from a distance and you wonder what they're really like. For a number of years, I had read John's books and listened to his podcast and didn't know him. Then I had the privilege of meeting him and I was even more encouraged because I got to know his heart was uh, exactly what you'd hope it would be. A man who deeply loves Jesus has committed to making an impact in the world. So I'm thrilled that he's here. We're privileged to have him as part of our church family this week and in the future. Uh, in order to prepare ourselves for the message he's going to bring, I've asked Jan Bowsman to come and read scripture. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word. First Corinthians 15, one to eight. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are all still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as the one abnormally born. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, you can sit down now, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's always good fun to be back. Um, you call this spring? This is spring. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, funnest things that uh, Buff and I used to do uh, back in Australia before we moved to America six months ago uh, was run a course for sceptical or inquiring people about the Christian faith uh, in our home. We'd meet for something like six, say, Wednesday nights in a row. There'd be a lovely glass of wine and some cheese and we would uh, read through Luke's gospel together and people would just fire their questions uh, at us and we'd do our best over six weeks to you know, bumble our way through the Christian faith. It was enormous fun. And uh, I hope I can find a place to, to do it uh, h here in America. But anyway, um, on one of these uh, courses, uh, some years ago now, there was this um, highly intelligent, articulate woman who was a loud critic of the Christian faith. Now, this is not an actual photo of the woman I'm referring to, uh, but it kind of captures the vibe. Uh, 
Each evening, as I would sort of share the material, she'd say things like, that's stupid, which is not as offensive as it might be here in America. In Australia, you can sort of say that. But I would try and engage her, and she would say things like, there's just no evidence. If there were evidence for all this stuff, then you might have my interest, but there's just no evidence. She would go on like this, and I would just do my best to answer her questions and point out to her what seemed to me to be evidence, and she wouldn't have a bar of it. Fourth week, after the formalities, I'm having a little chit-chat with her, and she lets slip that actually her real gripe against Christianity was this auntie she grew up with who was Christian and a complete bully, apparently. Self-righteous, moralistic, and a little bit hateful. And she said, that turned me right off Christianity. I, of course, pointed out that for the whole course, she's been saying that it's all about evidence. If there were evidence, she would believe, but there's no evidence, so she doesn't believe. And now you're telling me that it's because you had a bad experience of a Christian? And very honestly and insightfully, she said, well, it's both. It's both. And I tell you that because it's one of many conversations I've had over the years where it is clear that evidence isn't everything. That how you approach the Christian faith, especially something like the resurrection, is determined not just by facts, but by your experiences, your assumptions, and even your preferences. I do think evidence will play a part for some, which is why it's worth, you know, like one talk, but it's not everything. Okay, I tell you that because pretty much everything I'm gonna say now is about evidence. And so <laughs> I just want to set it in the context that I don't think this solves everything. And I want to begin with a quotation that sounds like it comes from some Christian minister or uh, you know, defender of the Christian faith, but actually not so much. Concerning the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday, I was for decades a denier. I am no longer a denier since the following deliberation has caused me to think this through anew. When these peasants, shepherds and fishermen who betrayed and denied their master and then failed him miserably suddenly could be changed overnight into a confident mission society convinced of salvation and able to work with much more success after Easter than before Easter, then no vision or hallucination is sufficient to explain such a revolutionary transformation. If the defeated and depressed group of disciples overnight could change into a victorious movement of faith based only on auto-suggestion or self-deception without a fundamental faith experience, then this would be a much greater miracle than the resurrection itself. In a purely logical analysis, the resurrection of Jesus is the lesser of two evils for all those who seek a rational explanation of the worldwide consequences of that Easter faith. This was not written by a clergyman or Christian academic, but by the late great Pincus Lapid, a professor of history at Bar Ilan University in Israel and a Jewish man who did not believe in Christianity, but he wrote a book on the resurrection of Jesus in which he concluded Jesus probably rose again on just historical, rational grounds. And the back part of the book is an explanation of why he's not gonna become a Christian as a result. It's a really interesting uh, book. But the reason I quote Lapid is not to say, aha, a smart person who's not a Christian believes in the resurrection, therefore you should. That's not my point. My point is, the resurrection is taken more seriously in academia, even amongst those who don't believe in Christianity, than you might imagine. This is not like the events of Middle Earth, you know, from The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. This is looked at like an event 
of the history of the Middle East. And uh, way back in 1996, when I first started my historical studies, um, uh, th there were 94 peer-reviewed works on the resurrection of Jesus, uh, according to this very famous uh, annotated bibliography. Um, these are not theological works on the resurrection. These are historical works. And I would say this number is now tripled in the years since. And some of the most important ones are like this 1998 volume, The Resurrection, which was uh, based on a symposium at Oxford University all about the resurrection. They gathered scientists and philosophers and historians. I think they let some theologians in and they gave papers on the resurrection of Jesus and then published the papers. Uh, then there was this uh, 2003 volume, The Resurrection of the Son of God, it's about 800 pages, well worth reading, um, you know, or just having as a book, you know, stop or a doorstop or whatever. The 2004 book by the atheist, Gerd Ludemann, the resurrection of Christ, in which he nonetheless comes to some pretty interesting conclusions that there are some very likely things in this story. Then there's the fantastic 2008 book by the professor of Jewish studies, again, not a Christian, simply titled The Resurrection. 2019 book by Bruce Chilton, The Logic of the Resurrection, uh, which, which he's a very skeptical man, but nonetheless takes the resurrection seriously. And perhaps the most important book is the most uh, recent one, really. Uh, in 2021, Dale Allison of Princeton published uh, this book, The Resurrection of Jesus, Apologetics, Polemics, and History. And the interesting thing about what Dale Allison routinely does is he is well known for criticizing uh, Christian apologists, on the one hand, and the arbitrary academic skeptics, on the other. He criticizes Christian apologists for pushing the evidence too far, which actually apologists often do. But he criticizes the arbitrary academic skeptics for suddenly abandoning the rules of history when it comes to the resurrection. He'll say, you follow the rules of history through the life of Jesus, but suddenly when you get to the resurrection, you throw them out and say, nah, nothing here. So I thought it might be interesting to just spend a little time on some of the rules of history, just four of them, before turning to the two facts of the resurrection that most experts, regardless of their faith, agree on. Okay, sound like a plan? So four rules of history, and hopefully this won't feel like a history lecture, but maybe just a little bit. Uh, and then the two facts of the resurrection. Rule number one of history is sources written close in time to events are less likely to contain legendary embellishment. That's not rocket science. You'd invent that whether you're a professional historian or not. If you've got an event, right, that happened in the past and say the, the first source written about it was so long after, like when there are no eyewitnesses still alive to correct the record, that's your only source referring to the event, you're right to be skeptical, right? or at least a little bit suspicious, not entirely confident. Actually, the New Testament uh, does really well on this score because all of the New Testament texts, all of them, were written within the period when eyewitnesses were all alive, which is a remarkable thing. But anyway, the second uh, uh, test of history or rule of history is that events recorded in two or more sources are more plausible than events recorded in one source only. And the reason for that is obvious. If you hear news from one person, you may or may not believe it. I guess it depends how trustworthy that person usually is. But if you hear it from two different sources and you know they haven't colluded with each other, you're more likely to believe it. What about three, four, five, six? And of course, my point is, in the New Testament are at least five completely separate sources now bundled together into the New Testament. The third um, rule of history is that authors in a position to know the information they report are more valuable than authors who record unsourced hearsay. And again, this is not rocket science, this is just obvious. We want there to be, we want our authors to, to have a clue, to be in a position to have known what really happened. And in the case of the New Testament, we of course have eyewitness writers at least in the case of um, Paul and John and James and maybe some others. Um, 
But even our authors like Mark and Luke, who wrote biographies of Jesus, aren't writing as hearsay because we know beyond doubting that Mark and Luke were associates of eyewitnesses. Their gospels are like the best journalism based on what eyewitnesses said. The fourth rule of history, uh, again, is not that surprising. It's just that testimony given against interest is more credible than testimony given for benefit. Um, if anyone's a lawyer here, you'll know this principle well. Um, in a court of law, or, or if you just watch um, Law and Order. Anyone watch Law and Order? Yeah, a few of you. Okay, you're expert already on this. You know that when a witness is in the stand and you know they're benefiting from their testimony, they're getting something for doing it, you're right to be a little bit suspicious. But if someone in the witness box is saying stuff that maybe makes them look bad or goes against them in some way, their testimony is amped up in credibility, just a little bit. Well, of course, in the case of the New Testament writers, and I'll say more about this in a moment, they didn't get lots of fun things for saying, we saw Jesus. Okay, not lots of fun things. Some bad things came their way. All right, these are the four rules of history. Um, there could be many more, but these are four basic ones. To hold in mind, now we look at the two facts of the resurrection. And you'll see why these rules of history help even secular historians think something very serious happened that first Easter day. Even if we're not sure what it is, it's a bit creepy. First fact, the tomb in which Jesus was laid was very probably found ent uh, empty. Now, personally, I'm sure it was found empty, but I'm just giving you what the historian will say. Very probably found empty. And this is not just the sort of thing a Christian will say. Here is a non-Christian scholar, Gaze of Amesh, professor of Jewish studies for 30 years at Oxford University. And he remarks, from these various records, he's talking about the New Testament records, two reasonably convincing points merge. One is positive, the other negative. First, the women belonging to the entourage of Jesus discovered an empty tomb and were definite that it was the tomb. Second, the rumor that the apostles stole the body is most improbable. There are at least three reasons someone like Gaze of Amesh and many others think there probably was an empty tomb. Number one, this is mentioned in separate sources, at least three, probably more, separate sources that haven't been copied from one another. Secondly, there's very good evidence that the elites who were critics of Christianity in Jerusalem at the time said, no, 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 you disciples stole the body from the tomb. We know that's what they said. And what does that tell the modern historian? They agreed there was an empty tomb. They were just arguing over how it got that way. If they're saying, you disciples stole that body from the tomb, there's obviously an empty tomb. Because if there wasn't an empty tomb, they'd go, what are you saying? Let's go roll the stone away and have a look. The third reason uh, why most scholars think there was an empty tomb is that the story of the discovery of the empty tomb, heroes, women. Now, I know you might go, that's cool. That's because we've been influenced by the wonderful strides forward in our culture in supporting women. But in the ancient world, did you know that a woman's testimony was not even allowed in court? I'm embarrassed even to read these texts. Here are some ancient texts about women's testimony. From women, let no evidence be accepted because of the levity and temerity of their sex. I'm embarrassed even to read it out, but this is an ancient text from the first century. Or this one. The law governing an oath of testimony applies to men and not to women, to those who are suitable to bear witness and not to those who are unsuitable to bear witness. Here's my point, and all scholars point this out. If you were making up a story and you wanted people in the first century to believe it, you would not hero women as the first witnesses to an empty tomb. Unless it just happened. Somewhat embarrassingly, it was women 
who discovered the empty tomb. And, and this is um, partly why uh, historians say, yep, there very was, very likely was an empty tomb. Okay, but an empty tomb can be interpreted in a number of ways. One of them is the disciples stole the body. So actually, it's not just the fact of the empty tomb that leads historians to think something very interesting went on Easter day. It's the second fact in tandem with the first that leads them to this conclusion. The second fact, from the beginning, people claimed in good faith to have seen the risen Jesus. The wording here is intentionally precise. From the beginning, people claimed in good faith to have seen the risen Jesus. This is a fact agreed upon by virtually all secular historians who are puzzling through the story of the resurrection. Our evidence in this regard is widespread, early, unexpected, and sincere. By widespread, I just mean it's in all of our sources. It's everywhere. And so historians just go, it's a no-brainer that if you transported yourself back into, say, the year 35, just a few years after the events, it's a fact you'd find lots of people who said they saw Jesus. Now, we might think they're crazy. That's, that's another discussion. But it's a fact that they sincerely claimed they had seen Jesus because it's everywhere in our sources. Um, why do I say it's early? Because the passage Jan just read us has some lines in it that we can date to within just a few years of the events themselves. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter, but he quotes the bit in yellow, what scholars regard as an ancient creed, that is a summary of the Christian faith that Christians as early as 35, AD 35, said out loud as a summary of the Christian faith, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the 12. Even atheist and agnostic scholars like Gerd Ludemann and Robert Funk agree that this statement comes from almost immediately after the events. I had the enormous privilege, sort of when I was starting out in my historical studies, this was 2005 now, and I was filming a documentary about the sources for Christianity, I got to handle the most ancient copy of this very text. Now don't freak out that the guy on the screen you're about to see looks like my younger brother. It is just, it is just the younger, slimmer, better looking John Dixon from 2005, let's go. In this glass frame is the earliest example of Christian oral tradition. Here, the Apostle Paul reminds the Corinthians of a fixed summary of the Christian faith, which he passed on to them years earlier, and which he himself had received shortly after his conversion. Mainstream scholars date this summary to within months of Jesus' death. Hoti Christos apethenen huperton hamation hemon katatas graphas that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Kaihoti etafe, and that he was buried. Kaihoti egergatai tehemera tetrite katatas grafas, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Kaihoti ofthe kefa eta tois dodeka, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the 12. These words were in common Christian usage before the year 35. Whatever else we may want to say about the basic plot of Jesus' life, it clearly wasn't a legend growing up over time. This fixed summary or creed... Okay, we, 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 yeah. isn't he cute? Isn't he cute? <laughs> so cute. Uh, the point is, uh, this, this is so early, no one, even the highly sceptical scholars, say that the resurrection story is made up as an um, accumulating legend. It's, it's too instantaneous to the events. Why do I say uh, it is 
unexpected. Why is the evidence about people seeing Jesus unexpected? Because at least two of the key eyewitnesses were non-Christians when they met the risen Jesus. They then became Christians, right? As you would too, right? But they were non-Christians when they came across Jesus. Jesus didn't just appear to, appear to those who believed in him. And, and at least two are um, James, who is actually Jesus' half-brother, grew up with him. And according to the Gospels, consistently, James was an unbeliever right up to the resurrection and then had an appearance of Jesus and became a leader in Christianity. And that didn't go so well for him because then he was executed. And the other is Paul, the apostle, who wrote this letter and who quotes this creed. Paul was an outright critic of Christianity. Way more vitriolic than the woman I had in uh, my Christianity course. He actually went out and arrested people for being Christians in that first year of Christianity. And then he met Jesus, he said. And we have his eyewitness testimony to having met Jesus. It is unexpected. Why do I say it is sincere? How do we know those running around saying, I've seen him, I've seen him, meant it? How do we know they really thought they were saying the truth? Even if they were nuts, how do we know they were sincere? The simple reason is, if they benefited from their claim to have seen Jesus, we might be suspicious. It's a classic principle uh, from, uh, from history and from courts of law. When someone benefits from their testimony, we're a little bit suspicious. But that didn't happen. It's not like these apostles suddenly were given the Vatican with all of its treasures underneath the basement, right? No, they suffered social estrangement. They lost property. They were regularly imprisoned. And in the case of at least four of the key eyewitnesses, we know they were executed for their public insistence, I have seen Jesus alive. Now, of course, people die for stuff they merely believe. I know that. But these are the people who knew whether or not it was true. See, if I were to die for my Christian faith right now, Right, you know, someone held a gun to my head and said, are you a Christian? And I go, mm, yes, and I died for my faith. What, what would you conclude? You would conclude, I really believed it. But these are the people who knew if it were true or not. I, I merely am super confident enough to give my life. But these are the people who knew if it were made up. Who dies for something they know to be a lie? And this is why scholars as skeptical as Ed Sanders of Duke University will say what most scholars will say, I do not regard deliberate fraud as a worthwhile explanation. Many of the people in these lists of witnesses that I just quoted were to spend the rest of their lives proclaiming that they had seen the risen Lord and several of them would die for their cause. Who dies for a cause they know not to be true? This is why I say the evidence is widespread, early, unexpected, and yes, sincere. And this is where the history leads us. An empty tomb and loads of people saying, I've seen him. They're the two facts. But this is also where history, I'm afraid to say, has to leave us. History can't take us any further than that. What you do with that information actually has way more to do with your preferences, your assumptions, your life experiences. It's not about the evidence. And the interesting thing is most of these experts who aren't Christians, who remain maybe agnostic about the whole thing, don't try and disprove the resurrection. They don't try and explain away these facts. I just quoted Ed Sanders of Duke University. He's been one of the leaders for 30 years in this whole field He's agnostic about the resurrection. He, well, look, look what he says. That Jesus' followers and later Paul had resurrection experiences is in my judgment a fact. What the reality was that gave rise to the experiences, I do not know. He's saying something weird happened. I just don't know what it is. It's above my pay grade as a historian. 
And that's a conclusion reached by so many people, including Geza Vamesh. This is one of the translators of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, he'd, read, he'd written seven books on the historical Jesus as a non-Christian. And his books are fantastic, actually. And throughout those previous seven books, he would hint what, at what he thought about the resurrection. And so we were all eager. In 2008, when his book, The Resurrection, came out, we all rushed out and got the eighth book of the great gaze of Amesh to find out what he really thought about the resurrection. And he just spent 250 pages saying the same thing he'd hinted at. And they're the two things I've just told you. There was an empty tomb. And there were many people saying, I've seen him all the way to their deaths. So what do you think, Gaze of Amesh? And then there's this epilogue at the back of the book that goes through these six rational ways of trying to explain away those two facts. The Romans let him go, the disciples stole the body, Jesus got better in the tomb and you know, rolled the stone away, all that sort of stuff, right? Went through them all. And Gaze of Amesh says, there's, there's just no way these meet historical standards. So then I desperately turn over to the last page to see, well, what did you think then? And that's a blank page. <laughs> he doesn't tell us. My point is, even secular scholars reckon we have the kind of historical evidence a resurrection would leave behind and much more evidence pointing in that direction than we would expect if it were a mistake, a legend, or a fraud. See, if you think about it, what kind of evidence could a resurrection in the first century have left behind? The only kind of evidence it could leave behind is evidence of an empty tomb and evidence that tons of people thought they saw him. There's no other kind of evidence. And it's exactly the kind of evidence we have. And it's that surplus of evidence for those two facts that lead people to think we do have the exact kind of evidence you'd expect a resurrection to leave behind. So here's the thing. I actually don't think evidence is the problem. I reckon it's as much to do with our assumptions, our experiences, our personal preferences. See, some people might be sitting there going, um, but I don't believe there's a God. So I don't believe the laws of nature can be, you know, bent or whatever. So it doesn't matter how good your evidence for the resurrection is, I'm never gonna believe it because resurrections don't happen. That's fine, I just want you to acknowledge that that's your background assumption playing with how you interpret evidence. It isn't the evidence. Because someone can just turn around and go, yeah, but it looks more likely that there's a mind behind the universe, that there's a God behind creation. And if that's the case, then all we've got to ask is, do we have the kind of evidence a resurrection would leave behind? And in the case of just one, the answer is yes. I don't know if you've heard about the man who woke up one morning absolutely convinced he was dead. And his wife said, uh, no, darling, you're not dead. He said, yes, I am. Uh, she said, but you're telling me you're dead. That doesn't happen. No, 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 nothing she could say could convince him he wasn't dead. So she invited a doctor friend over who came over with his big textbook, sat down, explained that he was dead. He just wouldn't believe it. And the doctor had this great idea, okay, I wanna to go to this medical textbook. I wanna to go to one of the incontrovertible facts about dead people. If they've been dead for eight hours as you have been, uh, the heart has stopped, the blood has stopped circulating, dead people don't, be uh, don't bleed. And he showed them the science of blood flow. And the guy read it, he's going, yeah, that's really interesting. The evidence seems overwhelming. Dead people don't bleed. At which point the doctor got a pin, jabbed it in his arm. Blood spurting everywhere. And the guy looked at his arm and went, well, what do you know? Dead people do bleed after all. <laughs> okay, that's the only untrue thing I'm saying. Also. <laughs> it's a lame dad joke. My daughter's here and she's going, oh, dad. Why do I tell you that? 
I'm not saying the evidence for the resurrection is as proven as the science of blood flow, but I am saying evidence isn't the only thing. Sometimes people have just locked in their head, resurrection isn't true. Nothing you can lay before them will lead them to change their mind. Dead people don't bleed. Oh, well, what do you know? Dead people do bleed after all. So what do we do? I just say, take a little step in the right direction. If you're not a believer here, you know, fantastic that, that you're here. I love that this is a church where that can happen. People who aren't sure what to make of Christianity can happily come here and not feel freaked out. And I wanna say to you, I'm not asking you to leap off into the unknown. I'm just saying, if you think there might be something to this, take a little step in the right direction. Because there are some people who won't. <laughs> I've got this friend in Sydney. He had also been in one of these courses that Buff and I ran. He's a statistician. His name is Graham. And he, he, he had a million questions. He, he was never very shouty. A million questions about the Christian faith. And so I went out for coffee pretty regularly with him to sort of go through the questions. He wanted to cross every T, dot every I, have every question answered before even making a little step toward the Christian faith. And I said to him, why are you doing that? He says, well, that's what I do in my work as a statistician. We need to know everything before we, you know, take one little step. I said, can you imagine applying that to a relationship? And he said, oh yeah, I've done that once or twice. I said, what do you do in a relationship? If you're, you know, you're developing a relationship, you get sort of some warmth coming your way. You don't suddenly leap into the relationship. What do you do? You take a little step toward it. Just give a little bit of yourself, right? That's what you do. And you wait to see what comes back. And if something warm comes back, you take a little step forward and see what comes back. And I said to Graham, Christianity is way more like a real world relationship than it is like a mathematical formula. <laughs> Take a little step in the right direction and see what comes back. Don't just shout at the Christian faith because our views about Christ are only partly informed by intellectual evidence. Equally influential are our assumptions, our experiences, and our preferences. And so I ask all of us, with all of our minds and hearts and experiences and assumptions, just a little step forward in the right direction and watch what comes back. God bless. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, and keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. <laughs>